Well, that video is all about a not so ordinary weekend at Sagebrush. And if you can't tell, it's a not so ordinary weekend at Sagebrush because I'm not Todd. <laughs> so what gave it away? Was, was it the hair? <laughs> Knew it. No, I know I'm a new face for, for some of you guys. Um, my name is Tim McPherson. I'm actually, uh, I'm one of the pastors here on staff at Sagebrush. I've been on staff actually for the last five years, the first four of which I was the Riverside Middle School pastor. So I loved that job. One of my favorite things I ever got to do in my whole life. But one day I woke up and my knees hurt and all my hair had fallen out and I thought it's time to go. Uh, I had nothing left to give, you know what I mean? So it was done. So actually for the last year, I, uh, I've been the, uh, the campus pastor for our Enchanted Hills location up in Rio Rancho. My family and I, we love our Enchanted Hills family. We love getting to, to, to come alongside that community and make Jesus known in Rio, Rio Rancho. But really my family and I, we love getting to be a part of Sagebrush overall. We are so excited to, to come alongside you and see all the amazing things that God does through this church um, at, at all of our campuses in New Mexico and even in Belize. We're, we're, just, we're just thankful to be along the, the ride with you. So speaking of my family, though, let me show you a picture of my favorite people in the world. This is my family. That's right. <laughs> You're clapping because you know there's proof that there is a God if that guy can end up with a family like that. You know what I mean? It's, there's hope for you if you're single, right? So that's, that's my wife, Natalie. Uh, she and I have been married for nine and a half years. So that's right, nine, nine and a half years, because I know my anniversary is sometime in July. <laughs> so uh, that, that's, our, that's our daughter, Eleanor. She's five years old and she is crushing it in kindergarten. And then that's our little boy, Levi. He is three years old and he is crushing it because he just breaks everything in my house. <laughs> so, but uh, man, from my family to you guys, I just want you to know this, the, the way you have loved us and uh, in small ways and in big ways, man, we just, we're so thankful for you guys as our church family and our church community. And we're, like I said, my family, we, we're just excited to be along the ride and see what God does through our church uh, in the future too. So I'm um, excited to where we've been as a church uh, over the last couple of months as we've been in this series called Escaping Ordinary, where we're looking at what does it look like for you and me as followers of Jesus? How do we step into the, the full, the abundant life, the extraordinary life that Jesus created us to live. How do we do that? Not just when we get to heaven someday, but what does it look like for us to do that now on earth in, in this life? And so that's what we're gonna dive into today and kind of start things off. Uh, I don't know if you're like me or not, but uh, if you are this last week, you probably started talking about or at least thinking about the kind of New Year's resolutions that, that you wanted to make this year, right? What do I wanna work on this year? What, do I, what part of my life from last year do I wanna improve on and make better? And so I'm a bit of a nerd and I, I studied up on this and I, I looked at some studies on how we make New Year's resolutions. And did you know that out of all the Americans that are gonna make New Year's resolutions this year, 75% of them will keep their res resolutions for a whole week? Impressive, I know, right? And so how about this? The ones that make it past that whole week, out of those that make it past the first week, 80% um, of those will fail by February. So the odds are not in your, they've never been in your favor when it comes to resolutions, right? Because this isn't new information. You laugh because you know it's true. We joke about how, man, the, the gyms are full in January and then they're empty by March and my gym rats in here are praying for March to come. Why, but here's my question, right? We know we don't follow through on resolutions, so here's, here's my big question for today, why? Like, well, like, really, why do we keep doing this to ourselves? We know we don't follow through on our resolutions, so why, why year after year do we keep making them? Well, I think it's because it's down, down to your core. You know this is true, that better is possible in your life. At the very least, you want better in your life, right? We all want a better marriage. We all want better relationships with, with our kids and our, with our friends. We all want better health, whether it's mentally, physically, emotionally, we want better next year. Here's the sad reality of this. Those same studies, they tell us this, that year after year, fewer and fewer people each year even bother to make a New Year's resolution in the first place. So what does that mean? Well, it tells us that we know better is out there. We just don't think it's possible for people like us. And maybe in the past it's because you tried and you failed and that robbed you of, of any sort of hope that somebody like you could change or get better. And here's the truth, let's just be honest. Why do our resolutions fail? It's probably because we tried to go too big in, in, in the past, right? Like, listen, new year, new me, let's be honest at church for just a second. Nod your head with me. Let's just all agree, right? We have all had that moment where we, had, we made a New Year's resolution where we said, that's it, I'm waking up at five in the morning to go to the gym every day. Nod your head, have you done that? 
cool, thank you for being honest. We can be friends. I appreciate that one. Yeah, because that's me, right? We've, we've all made those resolutions where we went really big and like, this is the year I'm gonna go cold turkey on the junk food. I'm not gonna do that anymore. I'm gonna get rid of all the junk food and the snacks out of my pantry and replace that with quinoa and kale. <laughs> but you know, just a few weeks later, after a couple small compromises, you'll catch yourself, you'll find yourself sitting there on the couch eating Cheetos and Twinkies in a couple weeks. Mm-hmm, that's me. Maybe you made some resolutions in, in your relationships in life, right? Maybe, maybe last year you went really big and you said, this is the year. I'm not going to end this year single. I'm going to get engaged. I'm going to get married. And yet here you are at the start of another year, still single. Or maybe it's the other way. Maybe last year you resolved, your resolution was, I'm going to end this toxic relationship that I am and uh, that I'm in. Except now it's the start of a new year and here you are still sitting next to that same loser as last year. <laughs> Eyes up here. Eyes up here. <laughs> I'm trying to hell, that's an awkward, that's an awkward car ride home, isn't it? <laughs> See, we go too big and we, we resign ourselves, we settle for ordinary like everybody else. And here's the thing, I'm, I'm not any better than you guys, okay? You can ask my wife this, the last four years, my New Year's resolution was that I was gonna go to the gym and get big. <laughs> you know, that one, it hurts when you laugh, just saying it. <laughs> How about this though? I think we do the same thing in our, in our spiritual lives, don't we? I think there have been times in the past where we have resolved that this was gonna be the year that I talk to God, I pray to God more than I ever have. And so this is the year that I'm gonna wake up early before the kids wake up, before anybody else is up, and I'm gonna spend time in the quiet of the morning and I'm gonna pray and talk to God. And if you're like me, you wake up early, you sit in your best, comfiest chair in the living room and you realize how comfy it is and you fall back asleep. Or how about this, maybe in the past you've resolved, this is gonna be the year that I know God's word more than I ever have, and so I'm gonna read the Bible every single day, and then, like what happened last year, the last couple of years, Disney releases a new season of the best show ever made, The Mandalorian, Mm -hmm. and it's not your fault you didn't read your Bible, you had to see what happened to Baby Yoda later, right? Like, that was first. Or how about this, maybe in the past you and your spouse have resolved that this is gonna be the year that we finally, we get the right people sitting around us in in, in our lives, in our corner. This is gonna be the year that we get into a small group just as soon as football, sorry, baseball. Did I say baseball? I meant wrestling. No, cheer season is over for the kids. Then we'll get into a small group. Here's my whole point with that, man. In light of how we know we don't do well with resolutions, but we all desire for better in our lives, here's the question I want us to think through for just a second today. What if the key to escaping your ordinary life is not in making big, life-changing New Year's resolutions. What if instead you could have the extraordinary life that you've always wanted, that God created you to have? What if the key to an extraordinary life is in the small things? It actually fits really well with where we've been over the last couple of months in this series called Escaping Ordinary. Every single week, we've opened up the book of Acts and we've seen how God moved and used the early church to do mighty things to change not only their lives, but they changed the world. They changed history, didn't they? But I want you to catch this before we dive too deep into this today. Here's where I want us to start. You gotta notice this. The early church, they didn't focus on the the, the big picture, the big stuff. Here's what they did focus on, being faithful with some small things. In fact, all the way back in Acts chapter two, towards the beginning of Acts, we have a very short list of some small things that they devoted themselves to. I want want to read this to you. Look at what it says in Acts chapter two. It says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer, and that was it. No New Year's resolutions with quinoa and kale required to change the world or your life. It was just those few small things to being devoted, to being committed to reading God's word every day, to doing life together with other Christians in a small group, to praying, they resolved to pray with and for each other, to pray more. I mean, they were committed. We saw this every single week of the series, didn't we, that they were committed to boldly sharing their faith, and they changed the world, didn't they? Through some, through some small things. And so as we kind of start this new year, here's the, the one truth that I want us to start this new year with. It's something that the early church knew that I want us to hold on to in 2023. And it simply goes like, it goes like this. A little faith does great things when it's placed in our great God. And if that's true, this is what I want us to think through. What would be the littlest, the smallest thing on that list that we just read that we as Sagebrush could commit ourselves to this year, that we could resolve to do this year? What would it be? What would be the, the easiest thing? To, I mean, the, the smallest thing to do. I mean, this thing that I'm thinking of, it's so easy that we honestly, we overlook it. That's how easy it is to, to overlook it. That's how small it is. But what would it be? I think for us as a church this year, it would be prayer. So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna open up the book of Acts once again like we have every other week. But today, this is what we're gonna see as we read God's word together. We're gonna see three choices that you and I have this year and the kind of people we get to choose to be in our prayer lives with God this year. 
And so Acts chapter 12, it opens with a devastating blow to the early church. One of the, church, the early church leaders, one of the, the original 12 disciples of Jesus, James, he's been arrested, he's been put on trial, and the Bible says that he was, then be, he was put to death by the sword, which probably means he was publicly executed, publicly beheaded. Well, the king that does this at this time is a man named King Herod of Agrippa. And this makes King Herod very popular with some of the Jewish folks that were trying to stop the early church movement. And Herod, he, he's a prideful man. He loves popularity, so he doubles down on this strategy. And he goes and he arrests another leader of the church, another one of Jesus' 12 disciples, Peter. And he throws him in jail. And in the morning, Herod intends to do to Peter what he did to James when Peter wakes up in the morning. That's where I want us to pick up. Look at this. Acts chapter 12, verse 5 says this. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. And so the night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep, fastened with two chains between two soldiers, and others stood guard at the prison gate. So you have to imagine the scene. The church has gathered up in somebody's house, and they're praying earnestly for Peter to be released from prison. Meanwhile, Peter is in prison, chained between two big, burly, buff guards. And what is he doing? Sleeping. Okay, give them credit, right? This is thousands of years before they made those super tasty melatonin gummies that we're all hooked on. <laughs> Talk about that next week, yeah. But Peter's sleeping. I, I, maybe you're braver than I am, but if, if I'm in Peter's situation and I know that my head is gonna roll off my shoulders in the morning, literally, I'm not taking a nap. I'm not, I'm pacing at least. So how does Peter have peace in this, in this situation, in a bad, tough, stressful circumstance, in a life-threatening circumstance? How was he able to find rest? It's because Peter had learned how to trust God no matter what. Because you've got to remember, Peter is the same man that writes the book of First Peter in the Bible. In that book, Peter simply puts it like this. He says, hey, this is what you should do. You should give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. See, Peter knew that he was going to be okay no matter what happened. So he's not anxious. He's not afraid. He's not stressed. He's not nervous. He's not scared. Why? Because he knows that God cares for him. And his response to knowing that God loves him and cares for him, he cast, Peter cast all of his cares and his worries upon God. You see, Peter had been praying long before bedtime. Peter had been praying all the time. And it actually leads us to the first choice and the kind of people you could get to choose to be this year in your prayer life. Do you want to be the kind of person that prays all the time or just when you need something? All right, let's, let's just think about this for a second, all right? Like we said, this new year, new me, let's be honest in church for a second, right? Your prayer life could be dead in the water. You haven't prayed in months, weeks, years even. It, your prayer life could be just straight up dead, but then all of a sudden it resurrects itself when you get pulled over by a cop and you need to get, get off on this one, right? Like Jesus, just one time, one time, Jesus, I'll be better next time. Or maybe you're a college student or a high school student. Maybe you remember these days, right? You could be a college student and, and your prayer life dead on arrival until... You sit down to take a test that you didn't have time to study for, right? And you're like, Jesus, just one time, beam the answers into my brain one time. It's always just once, isn't it? How about this? Maybe for Christmas this year, you got one of those nifty, cool ring doorbell cameras. You know what I'm talking about? The ones that where when somebody pushes the button, there's a camera and it shows you who's, who's hanging out at your door, right? This is super nice. This is really convenient. You love this thing until that doorbell camera goes off and you see your in-laws on the other side and they have come to stay with you for a couple weeks. You will pray, right? Listen, I'll put it on record, that's not from personal experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you think about it, you know this is true. This is not the kind of relationship that God wants to have with us where we just run to him when we need something or when we're in trouble, right? God wants to do life with you. That means all of life with you. And that's the kind of relationship that Peter has with God because Peter wants to talk with God. Peter longs to spend time with God, sharing with God, not just about the bad things in his life, but the good things and the boring things and the mundane things. See, Peter prays without ceasing. He prays all the time. That's why Peter has rest here because he knows God. He knows God's character. He knows God's heart for Peter. And so Peter knows that no matter what happens, that God is gonna do right by him. Imagine if what that would be like for you to have that kind of a relationship with God this year, with whatever you're facing with your marriage, whatever's going on in the lives of, of your kids, whether they're little or whether they're grown, whatever's going on in your life health-wise, imagine with what you brought in here with you today, the burden you've been dragging around all last year, imagine what it would do for you to have that kind of a relationship with God where you prayed without ceasing. You knew God cared for you and you were able to truly cast all of your cares and your worries upon God, that would be a relief for some of us. That would be a moment where some of us could rest for the first time in years, and I mean really rest. How do you have that kind of relationship? You have to choose to be the kind of person that prays all the time. That's Peter. That's why Peter, in this circumstance, he's just snoozing away in prison. And let's pick back up. The next verse says this about Peter. It says, suddenly there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter, 
The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrists. Then the angel told him, get dressed and put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. Now again, you've got to kind of picture the scene. The angel shows up and like Peter, again, he's found rest. He is in such a deep sleep that the angel has to be like, get up. I said, get up, right? Like if you are a parent of a teenager, you know what that's like when you wake him up for school in the morning, right? Just move. That's, the, that's how deep of a sleep Peter is in. And so Peter's kind of, he wakes up and he's kind of groggy. He sees this angel, but he thinks like, this is just a really cool dream I'm having. Sure, angel, what are we doing today? And so Peter falls this angel kind of sleepily, half awake. He falls this angel out of his cell past two guard posts and past an iron gate. And then Peter kind of snaps out of it and realizes that actually just happened. God freed me. And then I want you to see the very first thing that Peter does when he kind of snaps out of it. He wakes up and here's the first thing he does. The Bible says this. When he realized this, he went, went, went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. He knocked at the door in the gate, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter is standing at the door. You are out of your mind, they said. Poor Rhoda. Listen. She made it into the Bible, and her one story in the Bible ends with people going, you're crazy, girl. Uh Uh-huh. That's not fair. But imagine this. Again, this is the church. They have been praying earnestly for Peter to get out of prison. They got what they wanted, and they didn't buy it. They didn't believe it, right? They said, Rhoda, listen, you go tell Peter that we're in here busy actually praying for the real Peter. Get that one to buzz off, right? They got what they asked for, and they didn't believe that God would do it. And this is when I get frustrated, Maybe for you too, right? This is the moment where we read this and it's kind of frustrating to think like you got what you wanted, what you got answered your prayer and you didn't, you didn't buy it. And I get frustrated and I get mad until I realize that you and I, we can probably relate because we probably prayed the same way. We've prayed big, hairy, audacious prayers, but in the back of our mind, we're going, this one's too far of a long shot for God. Not, not for somebody, God's not gonna do that for somebody like me. See, that actually leads to the, the second choice and the kind of people we get to choose to be this year in our prayer lives with God. Do you want to be the kind of person that, that prays earnest, believing kind of prayers? Or do you want to keep praying unbelieving prayers where you just go through the motions? Now, you got to hear my heart on this one. I know this is hard for some of us because for some of us in this room, you stopped praying or you started going through the motions of prayer a long time ago. Because back when you used to pray earnestly, believing, when you would pray, it wasn't selfish prayers, was it? No, you you prayed for other people. You prayed for your loved one that was sick in the hospital. You prayed for healing for them. You prayed for peace with your kids or with your spouse. You prayed for God to resolve a a horrible, a hard situation that you were walking through. And whatever you prayed for, it didn't work out the way that you were hoping. And so now, if you pray, you go through the motions. You pray before dinner. God is great. God is good, I guess. Let's eat. Or maybe you still pray those big, hairy, audacious prayers, but you're just going through the motion, right? You're going, in the back of your mind, you've got this voice where you're going, God could do this, I guess, right? You've lost belief. You've lost hope that God would actually, would actually come through and have a plan for you. You've lost belief. I'll be honest with you. I'm sad to say I've been that person for, for much longer in my life than I would care to admit. You see, back when I was in college, we found out that my, my dad, who I'll just level with you, my dad is my, is my hero, okay? He was Superman to me. My, uh, in college, we found out that my dad was gonna have to have open heart surgery, and this frustrated me. Because my dad, it wasn't his fault. He'd always been healthy. He'd always taken care of himself. It was just a weird sort of genetic fluke where the doctor said, hey, the valve in his heart broke, so he's got to have open heart surgery. And that was frustrating to me because that wasn't fair. But on a deeper level, I got mad at God. Because the other part of the context here is that my dad is also a pastor. Really good one. And my dad, I mean, he, he, since I was born, since I can remember, my dad has been sold out on giving his life for the things of the kingdom, for pointing towards people, towards Jesus. And that's what my dad has always done. I mean, my dad was, was a missionary, my dad was a student pastor, and that takes somebody special. <laughs> my dad was a lead pastor. My dad was a church planner. And so I looked at God during that time when I found out he had to have surgery. And I went, hey, God, if anybody gets a pass, it's him, isn't it? But he didn't get a pass. The day of the surgery comes, and things don't go like they're supposed to. There's some complications. He barely makes it through that surgery, but because of the complications in that first surgery, For the next 18 months, my dad had to have 16 different follow-up procedures. Some of you know what that's like. In and out of the hospital, time and time again, hoping and praying to God that this is the last one. And when it's not, your hope dies just a little bit more. Well, in the middle of in the middle of all that, just to make things worse, my dad, because of one of the surgeries, the way his body reacted, my dad also developed an autoimmune disorder. 
And what this meant for him is that he would have what we called episodes, meaning that he would just, without warning, my dad's like six foot two, he would pass out and drop to the ground. And then when he would wake up, he'd be in so much pain, head to toe, he wouldn't be able to move or get out of bed for days at a time. And so you better believe I prayed earnestly for my father. And my prayers were really clear. I mean, there was no guessing about what I was asking for. God, would you heal my dad? Please. And he didn't. So I stopped praying earnestly for my dad. I just went through the motions. God, would you heal my dad? I guess. God, would you heal my dad if you're not too, too busy? Now, I'm not the one actually suffering and going through all those, those physical issues, but that was my heart. That was my prayer life during that time. On the flip side of things, my dad, who's actually the one dealing with all this, in the middle of all this, he starts going on mission trips to Cuba because he got bored. I don't understand. So he's going to Cuba, and what he does there, I love it. He would go out there, and he would train and develop and disciple and teach local missionaries and local pastors to go advance the kingdom in Cuba. Well, I think it was on his third trip. My dad's teaching one night, and he gets done. He he steps off stage, and some of these Cuban pastors, they, they circle up around my father, and they do something that the church has done for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. They circle up around my father, and they, they lay their hands on him, and they, they prayed for my dad earnestly. The way my dad tells it, he doesn't speak a lick of English, but the way he, he tells it, he could tell from their tone, it felt like they were going to the throne room of God on his behalf. Now, that was five years ago, and since that moment, my dad hasn't had one of his episodes. God healed my father. And you better believe God gets all the credit for that one. God is so good. But I don't tell you that story that, so that you'll walk out going, okay, so Tim, what you're saying is God doesn't answer my prayers because I just don't believe enough. I don't have enough faith. That's not true. Nowhere in the Bible does it talk about something like that. But here's what I, I do want to point out to you, okay? I tell you that story because I want you to notice, did my attitude, did my unbelieving prayers, did that do any good for my dad or for me or really my relationship with Jesus? Did it? No. So what I want to challenge us with today for some of us is to start or to restart that relationship where we begin as a church to pray earnestly, believing kind of prayers. And you might look at me and go, you know, Tim, I get that, but you don't understand what I'm walking through. I'm out of words. I'm out of prayers. I'm just tired. I get that. I was too. So let me give you a template of an example of what a really simple, a really honest and earnest prayer really looks like. It goes something like this. It's where you look at God and you go, hey, God, I can't with what's going on with my kids and my marriage, with work, with, with my health. What I'm dealing with right now, God, I can't. I can't fix it. I can't resolve it. God, I can't carry this. But God, I know you can, and I believe you. That's an earnest prayer, the kind of earnest prayer that I, th- I think the church was praying for Peter. And so Peter, he gets released from prison. This is where I'm supposed to stop telling you the story because I go, I'm supposed to say, and everyone lived happily ever after, that Almost. Remember King Herod, the one that started this whole thing, arrested Peter? I want you to see how his story ends towards the end of Acts chapter 12. It says this about Herod. It says, on the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robe, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a God, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down and he was eaten by worms and died. How would you like that on your obituary? eaten by worms and died. Hopefully not in that order. Anyway, but did you catch it? I mean, Herod stands up, he's wearing his his finest clothes, his regal, his royal robes. Now, Herod's not a good man, but I guess he's a good public speaker. He whips the people up into a frenzy and they begin to, to praise Herod as a god. The problem is Herod knew better, but he did this anyway. He took the credit, he took the praise for himself. And so what does God do? The one true God strikes him down. Why? Because God opposes the proud. So actually that leads to the last choice and the kind of person you and I get to choose to be this year in our prayer lives with God. And I'll level with you. I think this is the hardest one, but it's the most crucial. Do you wanna be the kind of person this year that prays humble prayers or prideful ones? Now, how do you know you've been prideful with God? Well, I think we've all experienced this, right? We get pri- we're prideful in our prayers with God when we get mad at God because he didn't come through on our terms, right? The opposite of that though, is, uh, is someone that prays humbly. That, that's someone that goes, God, I can't, but you can, and no matter what, you, what happens, Father, I trust you. I know that you're good and you've got a plan for my life. I trust you, God. 
let's dig a little bit deeper into this whole prideful heart towards God, okay? If you're prideful in your prayer life towards God, here's what I think has happened, and I'm guilty of this in my own life, is we've come to this conclusion, we don't say it out loud, but we come to this conclusion that kind of goes like this, God owes me. Right, you start kind of comparing yourself with other people, like, listen, I know, I know Mother Teresa, I'm not perfect, but have you seen my neighbors? <laughs> have you seen my cousins, have you seen them? Have you, I'm, I'm better than them, right? And then you think about it more, and you're like, God, I do some pretty good stuff. I'm not, I'm not perfect, but I do some good stuff, right? Like, God, like, like you're kind of lucky to have me on your team. I mean, I read my Bible most days. Mm-hmm. God, I'm not in one small group. I'm in two, super spiritual, yeah? God, I do the hardest thing there is to do around here at Sagebrush. I show up to church when Todd isn't teaching. <laughs> Took you a second. But deep down to the core, we have this, a prideful, a prideful prayer starts with that assumption that God owes me. And what happens when we pray like that? Well, God is not gonna come through ever just on our terms. And when he does, and if we're prideful with God, what happens? We get angry, we get mad, we get bitter, we get resentful. And some of us, we just walk away and quit on God. Sadly, I've seen this with some close family members and some really close friends. And here's what happens every time. Inevitably, they always come up to me and ask me the same question. Hey, Tim, if God is so good, and why does he let bad things happen to good people like me? Here's the problem with that way of thinking. It assumes you're good. It assumes that, that I'm good, but Jesus is really clear in the book of Mark. He, he doesn't leave any wiggle room for us. He says no one is good except God alone. I want you to think about it. If, if those words from Jesus, if those are true, you gotta think about this, then prayer is really not such a small thing because God is up in heaven being good and perfect. We are down here not good. But in spite of that, this God of the universe, this God that is holy, which means he's not like you and me. He is righteous. That means he is perfect, true, and good always, all the time. This God who is the creator of heaven and earth. And the Bible actually goes further and says this God who is the sustainer of all things. That means he holds your life together and my life together. He holds all things together. That same God of the universe, when we pray, that is that God of the universe hearing us. That is us building a relationship with this God of the universe. That same God wants to to know you and wants you to know him. That same God wants to show up in your lowest valley, in your worst moment, and walk with you through it. That is mind-blowing to me that we can pray to God like that. But before we can actually have a moment of honesty like that, before we can... Meet, have, before we can meet God where we're actually at, you need to know where you stand. You need to know where you find yourself. And again, the Bible is unflinchingly honest about where you and I stand. In the book of Romans, it says it really clearly when it says no one is righteous, not even one. Translation, God doesn't owe you. God doesn't owe me. But in spite of that, God loved you enough to take the wrath and the punishment that you and I deserve for our sin. He took that punishment and he poured it out on the only person who is good, his one and only son, Jesus Christ. Why? So that we could know God. So that we could pray. It's because of what Jesus did for us on the cross that that bridges the gap, that restores our relationship with God so that God hears our prayers and so that we can know him. And actually, the Bible actually goes further and says, hey, in light of the mighty sacrifice Jesus made for us on the cross so that we could pray to God, the Bible in the book of Hebrews says, this is how we're supposed to approach God now because of Jesus. It says this in Hebrews, let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. And I love this part. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace Grace to help us when we need it most. If you hear nothing else out of today, this is the one thing I want you to get, that this is a promise, friends. That no matter what you walk through this last year, no matter what this life throws at you in the next year or for the rest of your life, that no matter what, because of Jesus, you can approach God. You can have a relationship with God where you are bold and you are confident and God promises, this is the best part, that when you draw near to him, he'll give you what you need. For some of us, this is an invitation that that you need to take Jesus up on for the very first time where God is looking to you and saying, if you would just come near to me, I'll hold you together. When the world falls apart, God says, I'll hold you together. Just walk closer with me. I want you to hear this. So this is not God because God never promises this, that if you and I would just pray better prayers or if that you and I would just believe more that God would fix all of our problems, that God would, would pluck us out of our bad situation and make everything right. God doesn't promise to do that this side of heaven, but this is God so clearly promising that when you are in trouble, draw near to me and I'll give you what you need most in life. And what do you need when you're in trouble? You need your dad. Doesn't matter about your circumstances, you need your father. And we have this promise that through Jesus, we can have that relationship with God. It's kind of like this. Let's go back to my dad's story for just a second. 
I have no doubt that five years ago that God healed my father. But it leads me to ask this question. Is my dad's health, is that the point of his life? Is that the reason for his existence? Was my dad born just to, to be healthy, to get sick, and then for God to heal him? Is that the reason he lives? Is that the point of his life, his health? Because if it is, you gotta answer this one for me. My dad, five years ago, God healed my father, but then two years ago, my dad was diagnosed with Parkinson's. It's the problem with life. None of us make it out alive, so the circumstances, his health, that's not the point of his life. What is? I've seen it since I was a little kid. The point of my father's life is the same mission of this church. My dad lives to know Christ and to make Christ known. That is why to this day, in sickness and in health, my father continues to lead and train and develop the next generation of leaders and pastors that are gonna lead the church long after he is gone. That's why to this day, in sickness and in health, and right now, it's mostly in sickness, my father continues to put himself in situations where he will meet people that are far off from God. Why? So he gets a shot at bumping them into Jesus. Friends, he's making an eternal impact. That is an extraordinary life, isn't it? Where does that start for him, though? But you've got to think about where that starts. Because I'll tell you where it starts. It's, it's the same, same, same place today as it was when I was a little kid. See, to this day, just like when I was a kid, if you wake up early, early enough, you can catch him. You can catch my dad in the living room in his favorite chair, not sleeping, but his, his head is bowed and his Bible's open. And he's praying without ceasing. He's praying earnestly. He's praying humbly. I want you to hear this. That is where an extraordinary life begins. So how about this? Maybe you relate to Peter's story a little bit more because you're going, Tim, you don't understand with what the storm I'm facing right now. I, I, we just read this story where God fixed everything for Peter, pulled Peter out of his circumstances. You're right, but you gotta ask the same question. Was Peter's circumstances, was that the point of his life? Was that the point of his story? Because here's what we know is true too, that Peter gets released on this day and then there would come another day where Peter would once again be arrested. And on that day, once again, the church would gather up and they would pray earnestly for Peter to be released. But this time, it wouldn't happen. And we know this is true, that Peter was executed for the cause of Christ. And in that moment, was God good? Absolutely. But the point of Peter's story, the point of your story, the point of the story of this church is found at the very end of Acts chapter 12 when the Bible very simply says this, but the word of God continued to spread and flourish. You see, when the church does what it's supposed to, when we don't focus on all the big stuff that ordinary lives and ordinary people chase after, when we focus on the small things, the simple things that, that Jesus has commanded us and called us to be faithful with, when we do what we're supposed to, people come to know Jesus. That's an extraordinary life. And so what if this year that was our resolution? We resolve not to do the big stuff, but we resolve to do something so seemingly small as prayer. And we, we chose to be the kind of people that prayed all the time, without ceasing. We would cast our cares and our worries upon God so much so that we would have rest. We would show the world the kind of rest and peace that it so desperately needs and desires. And they would see that in our lives because of our relationship with God. What if we prayed without ceasing? What if we prayed earnestly, believing kind of prayers, saying, God, I don't know what's gonna happen, but I know you can because all things are possible with you. And most importantly, what if we prayed humble? Humble prayers, God, not what I want, but what you want. What would God do in your life if we prayed like that? What would God do in your life, in the life of your friends, your family, your neighbors? What would God do in our city, in our state, in this world if we committed to being those kind of people praying like that? I think he'd do more than we could ever imagine or dream. Because prayer, it seems small, but it changes everything. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, you are so good, and we know that because, Father, you brought us through, and some of, for some of us, you carried us through this past year. But, Fathers, we, we start into a new year, and we, we have all the distractions of life swirling around us, maybe for some of us coming down from the high of the holidays, and now we're in a low point, going back to everyday, ordinary life. God, we don't want that kind of life this year. And so, Father, I pray for us as a church, for us as your people, who you bought at a great price, of a, uh, with a great price. God, I pray that we be the kind of people that are faithful with the small things, 
we wouldn't focus on what everybody else is doing or what we think we need, but God, we would focus on what you called us to be faithful, faithful with, and that starts with prayer. Prayer that's without ceasing, prayer that is earnest, prayer that is humble. And God, I know that as we do that, we would step into the extraordinary, the abundant life that you have for us where we leave this world better than we found it. Father, I pray for those of us in here that, that have never heard this invitation or have never taken you up on this deal of grace through faith in your son Jesus to where we can know you. God, I pray that today is the day that they would make that decision to walk across that line of faith to know you through Jesus. God, we give you not just, not just this year, but we give you our lives and the big things, and especially, God, in the small things that we do this year, we give that to you because, Father, you give up everything for us when you sent Jesus to save us. So it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.